So good morning, everyone. Um, uh, welcome to this week's pre-Chinese New Year uh, uh, breakfast session at FOM. Uh, my name is Professor Sanjeev Mahadeva. I'm your moderator for the first half of this morning session. And I'm pleased to say that we have two excellent talks this morning, one from gastroenterology and the other from uh, breast surgery. Uh, it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce the uh, topic of the first speaker, uh, which is something close to my heart. So gastrointestinal endoscopy is a tool that has revolutionized the field of gastroenterology uh, because we have been able to see inside the gastrointestinal tract. Um, the new kid on the block is something called endoscopic ultrasound, where we now can see beyond uh, the gut. And today, uh, my speaker, uh, Dr. Stanley Koo, is going to talk to you about the field of gas endoscopic ultrasound and its applications in the pancreatobiliary uh, field. Let me just introduce Dr. Stanley. He is a, a junior consultant in the gastroenterology unit at a University of Malaya Medical Center. He has spent a lot of time uh, and training in the field of uh, endoscopic ultrasound uh, and has recently come back from a fellowship overseas uh, specializing in this field. So it gives me great pleasure to, uh, to hand the platform over to Dr. Stanley Koo for his topic on seeing beyond the gut, um, the application of endoscopic ultrasound in pancreatobiliary disease. Dr. Stanley. Uh, thank you, Prof. Sanjeev, for the kind introduction. And hello, good morning, everyone. So uh, I will share my slides. Just give me a minute. All right, Prof, you can see my slides, right? Yes, can see it now. Yeah. So uh, I'll begin my presentation. So uh, today I'll be talking about the role of endoscopic ultrasound in malignant pancreatic biliary diseases. Now, endoscopic ultrasound has wide application uh, in the GI tract and the uh, hepatopancreatic biliary uh, anatomy, but uh, I will zoom in more on what is its role on uh, uh, malignant diseases because uh, we do use it a lot in benign diseases as well. So those are something that I won't be talking about, which would be another topic on another day. So... Um, just, uh, so looking, looking at the introduction, in fact, endoscopic ultrasound started very early, in the, uh, as early as in the 1980s. And since then, it has primarily been used as a diagnostic modality in evaluation of the HPV anatomy. Not only that, GI subepithelial lesions, mediastinal lesions, etc. So the ability to combine endoscopy as well as ultrasound enable us to visualize uh, these anatomical structures right within the gut, uh, usually in the stomach and in the duodenum, to see the surrounding structures uh, surrounding the GI tract. It provides accurate anatomical uh, evaluation with high resolution images. And in recent times, the ability to do intervention or simple diagnostic uh, um, uh, interventions such as tissue acquisition, uh, has made it even much uh, more attractive modality of investigation in recent times. And uh, the good of it is it can be done like any other endoscopic procedures uh, using light sedation. And most of all, uh, it is safe and usually uh, do not concur any much catastrophic uh, complications. So just a pictorial, evidence, uh, pictorial uh, illustration of this, as you can see on the top right hand corner of the picture, it shows the probe of the endos endosco endoscope with the ultrasound uh, and it's connected to a, to a machine or, or interpreting machine to able to produce the image uh, seen on, uh, on the end echo endoscope. So as you can see the illustration at the bottom right hand corner of the, of the slide, as you can visualize that as the endoscope goes into the stomach, you are able to visualize the surrounding structures around it. So over here, you can see the bowel duct, the gallbladder, the portal vein, and as well as the uh, hepatic artery and the celiac artery, etc. 
So this makes a much closer uh, visualization of all these structures closer than before. So uh, the patient is usually uh, being lightly sedated, usually by midazolam, and uh, is in the left lateral position, and uh, the, the procedure can begin right straight away. It can at times be due as a daycare procedure as well. So let's talk about uh, tissue acquisition. So the first, one of the first tissue acquisitions was described in the early 90s. And uh, it, it was primarily used as uh, uh, tish, acquiring tissue from pancreatic lesions. And since then, it has been used in white, uh, widely used in many other lesions seen in the GI tract um, uh, in this current state. So we use uh, various, various forms of needles, as you can see over here. And uh, in the initial phase, aspiration is just aspirating cells to look under the microscope to be able to tell whether are they malignant or not. But since then, there are better cutting needles uh, available in the last uh, five to six years. As you can see, uh, for example, look at the acquired needle here you have and the sharp core needle here. They have very different cutting edge, um, uh, cutting tech mechanisms and technology which has turned currently now as fine needle biopsies. So in current state of mind, we almost never use FNA anymore, uh, but that's the history part of it. And uh, fine needle biopsy has largely replaced FNAs. So this enabled us to acquire more core tissues to be able to look at more uh, better cell structures and the whole anatomical structures of the, of the, of, of the, of the said uh, lesion. And of course, you can stain for further immunohistochemistry staining for further classification of the histological type of, of various, various uh, malignant diseases. So a little bit about pancreatic biliary malignancies. It includes a wide range, uh, so, uh, a wide range of uh, different types of pathologies that, that affects the pancreatic biliary system, mainly pancreatic CA, cholangeal carcinoma, uh, ampullary CA, gallbladder CAs, and various other malignant uh, diseases that may cause compressive uh, uh, effects on the pancreatic biliary system. While in, in our setting, uh, for illustration purposes, we look at most commonly pancreatic cancer and cholangeal carcinoma. Now, having said that, the only treatment modality here is almost always aimed for curative resection with or without chemotherapy. But however, um, as most of us know, majority of these cases are unresectable upon diagnosis. So data shows that up to 80% in pancreatic cancer and up to 61% in cholangeal carcinoma. So in Malaysia, pancreatic cancer accounts, though only accounts for 1.77% of all cancers reported up to 2011, but uh, a lot of them are usually unresectable. And most commonly, they present uh, uh, with symptoms of biliary obstruction mainly um, painless jaundice. So uh, a lot of my talks will be, uh, in the later part of the talks, will be circ circ circulating around uh, how do we treat uh, biliary obstruction caused by all these malignancies. So as a diagnostic tool, it provides excellent visualizations of all these structures. As I've said, mentioned in the earlier slides, this is especially so in smaller lesions of less than two centimeters. Uh, where sometimes CT and MRI will be difficult to pick out uh, as they are really very small. Uh, this is an advantage because we are, the probe is very close to the lesion. So even sub-centimeter lesions such as, as small as 0.5 centimeter lesions can be seen on endoscopic ultrasound. Not only that, with the ability to, to visualize the surrounding vascular structures we are able, and lymph, lymph nodes, we are able to provide accurate local regional staging in complement to CT and MRI imaging, though it should not be encouraged to use as an imaging modality alone, but it complements very well with other imaging modalities such as CT and MRI. Uh, with the help of contrast, uh, it were able to characterize pancreatic lesions better, but contrast enhanced in US is not available in Malaysia, so uh, I won't be going in depth into it. And of course, like I said, the ability to acquire tissue for histological diagnosis makes it um, um, uh, added advantage to other imaging modalities. So in pancreatic cancer, um, it's, uh, it's very good in characterizing, it's excellent in visualizing pancreatic lesions. It has a positivity and a specificity of over 90% as stated here. 
And in conjunction uh, to that, uh, the ability to assess resectability and vascular invasion of this pancreatic tumor with very high sensitivity and specificity of over 70 to 90 percent. Though arterial invasions are of lesser accuracy, it's very good in evaluating uh, venous uh, invasions, mainly the, the portal vein as well as the SMV. So uh, this helped in our surgical colleagues in access uh, resectability of pancreatic tumor, which is otherwise sometimes difficult to access based only on uh, CT alone. So as you can see, um, the treatment algorithm uh, guidelines of pancreatic CA is mostly will require CT scan at the start and we will classify whether it's a metastatic disease or locally advanced disease and would most in most cases would proceed to endoscopic ultrasound to assess even further the resectability, whether is it resectable, non-resectable, or borderline resectability with or without biopsy. So as you can see, this is an example of one of our cases. Uh, as you can see here, this is a pancreatic head mass with a SMV and portal vein invasion. As you can see, it's very clearly that the mass has invaded into the portal circulation system, as you can see very clearly over here. And this is the fine needle biopsy of the said lesion over here. So I'll just play, as you can see, the hypoechoic lesion here at the pancreatic head. And you can see the needle here passing into the uh, lesion. So what we do is we usually do various uh, withdrawal and uh, cutting techniques to cut as much as, as much tissue as possible to acquire histological diagnosis. So you can look at, you can visualize the needle here cutting through the, the, uh, the lesion over here. And what you will see is you will see core tissues here. As you can see, some white and reddish tissue here are very nice core tissues of uh, the lesion. And this case turned out to be a pancreatic adenocarcinoma, which is, of course, unresectable. So in the line of cholangial carcinoma, it's uh, rather different, whereby conventionally now we are still using, uh, we are still uh, um, very much dependent on <coughs> imaging modalities, mainly MRCP and uh, ERCP as a therapeutic and diagnostic modality in trying to evaluate this. So um, it is used when, EOS is used when the diagnosis is usually largely inconclusive or used again as a complement uh, in the case similar to pancreatic cancer. Though the sensitivity and specificity has a wide range because sometimes uh, hyla cholangial carcinoma is quite difficult to visualize on EOS uh, compared to mid to distal cholangial carcinoma. So um, the diagnostic ability, it still, uh, it still has a wide range of 50 to 90%. However, whenever any tissue is visualized, you are still able to acquire uh, tissue from there. So, um, so even their study says that the combination of use of EUS together with MRCP improves the sensitivity and specificity in detecting early cholangial carcinoma compared to just MRCP alone. So they posted very good sensitivity of about 90%, both uh, sensitivity and specificity. <clears throat> so if you look at the NCC and guidelines of the biliary pancreatic cancer, uh, the workup phase still goes like many other malignancies, CT, MRI, and of course, including uh, endoscopic ultrasound uh, within. So that is more about diagnostics. So in a nutshell, di diagnosis is mainly able to see the lesion, able to stage the lesion, as well as able to acquire tissue from the lesion. So that is as much as we can do in the diagnostic part of it. So let us move on to the therapeutic aspect of it. <clears throat> uh, so I'll be covering about three, three main, main diagnostic uh, that therapeutic aspect of it is mainly EOS guided celiac plexus neurosis. US guided RFA. And lastly, I will talk widely about uh, currently talking about US guided biliary drainage. <clears throat> so, US guided celiac plexus neurolysis is when we can visualize the celiac plexus very near to the celiac takeoff or the celiac artery based on the ultrasound, uh, visualized on the endoscopic ultrasound probe. And we are able to inject uh, neurolytic agents or energetic agents to neuralize or, <coughs> or inhibit pain. Uh, associated with the nerves of the celiac plexus. This resulting in re pain relief in the upper abdominal organs. So this is largely used for patients who have suffered pain, especially in advanced pancreatic cancer. So this is a double-blind uh, 
This study is done about 10 years ago, but it's still very relevant today, whereby EOS uh, guided CPN is used in comparison with conventional uh, pain relief methods. It is shown that um, EOS uh, CPN it can be used and is very effective in up to 30% in pain relief in all these advanced pancreatic cancer patients. So how about EOS guided RFA? So RFA uh, uses uh, high electromagnetic uh, energy to induce uh, burning and tissue destruction mainly in tumor cells. So it has commonly been used in uh, hepatocellular carcinoma intraoperatively as well as percutaneously. But endoscopically, it's still something very new and uh, it is minimally invasive and well tolerated. So recent evidence has still very new and they are using it mainly to ablate uh, pancreatic uh, malignant cystic neoplasms as well as pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. So here is our, one of our case who have a recurrent insulinoma uh, who has refused surgery. So uh, it was referred to us for RFA of the pancreatic lesion. So as you can see, this is the uh, two centimeter uh, pancreatic insulinoma at the body of the pancreas. As I inject the, um, as we inject the uh, RFA probe, you will start to see burning uh, speckles seen in the endoscopy ultrasound, which it shows that the burning on the RFA of the lesion is being going on over here. All right. So uh, the patient uh, has lower episodes of recurrent hypoglycemia. However, the tumor recurs as RFA is not a tr curative treatment modality. Uh, so as I illustrate in the next slide, uh, most of these uh, <coughs> cases are due to uh, 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 study has been limited to very small numbers of case series and case, uh, case uh, studies, uh, which shows mainly on uh, uh, IPMN and uh, malignant uh, cystic neoplasms as well as pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Though they are largely a uh, good technical success, the long-term success rate or the curative success rate is still yet to be uh, explored. So this is still something very new. So up to this point, uh, this is as much as we can do uh, in terms of the therapeutic aspect of EOS. Until recently, uh, where the, we opened a widen horizon uh, in, in the field of endoscopic ultrasound guided biliary drainage. As you, as you know, the, we are able to see the biliary tract and the liver uh, anatomy via the ultrasound uh, probe very accurately. And therefore, when we can see better, we are supposed to be able to do better. So, uh, so the next aspect, we'll talk, I'll talk about main, a, a lot about our years guided biliary drainage as well as our experience in UMMC. So endoscopic biliary drainage has always been the mainstay method in relieving malignant biliary obstruction. In unfortunate cases, most unresectable cases, biliary drainage is mainly for palliative intent. So up to, to this day, ERCP and it still is the main modality method for biliary drainage whenever possible. And percutaneous uh, transhepatic biliary drainage or PTBD has been used as a salvage method if ERCP fails or contraindicated. So there is a gap between these two and this when US biliary drainage has been emerged, has emerged in recent times as the alternative mode for biliary drainage. Now the principal technique is we are able to visualize the bowel duct, assess the bowel duct and to create drainage. Uh, via the GI tract uh, from the uh, SID, uh, whatever biliary system that we are visualizing. So that's the principal technique and all the different techniques will evolve around this very basic principle. So if you look at ERCP, uh, to make it very simple, we, we will uh, assess the bowel duct through transpapillary method, visualizing at the duodenum and we cannulate through the bowel duct or as you can see over here, and then we will place a stand across. Uh, that, that's very simple, as we can still be using it today. And this results in internal drainage. Whereas if you look at, if all these fails, we look at percutaneous PTBD, this results in external drainage. As you can see, percutaneously it access through the bowel duct and there's a bag uh, excreting into the uh, outside of the patient, which usually looks very uncomfortable. So this results in external drainage. Now, the problem with the current method is in ERCP is uh, there's high risk of pancreatitis and it is unable to perform if you are unable to see the papilla and there's recurrent cholangitis due to tumor obstruction or inadequate drainage. And in sometimes very difficult cases, the procedure can be very prolonged due to prolonged cannulation time in uh, assessing the, uh, the, the bowel duct. 
Now, the, the, the another issue with looking at PTBD is recurrent cholangitis. Patient usually feels very uh, uncomfortable and it's difficult to handle and take care of the tube. Bile and electrolyte loss into the back, tube dysfunction, blockage, dislodgement, infection, bleeding, you can name it, it's there. And more often than not, it requires higher incidence of re-intervention due to uh, uh, dysfunction of, all, uh, all the, uh, of the tube. Now, looking at advantages of EUSBD, first things first, um, we are able to visualize the anatomy very clearly, hence the, that the drainage is very accurate without the need of an ex external tube. We usually stand above the lesion, so recurrent biliary obstruction is not a problem and it, and it has provided longer uh, stand patency. Little to no risk of pancreatitis, and we are able to do it in whatever anatomy that is possible, even in altered surgical anatomy. Now, the disadvantage of it is uh, it is complex and it requires high level of expertise, and of course, it has higher complication rate if, it's going, if, if it goes wrong compared to ERCP. So these are the four methods of uh, US biliary uh, drainage, US guided rendezvous procedure, US guided anti-grade stand, uh, as well as uh, US guided cholelocal duodenostomy and US guided hepatical gastrostomy, of which the last two will be more commonly used. The first two is not that uh, ideal when you use to malignant diseases. So just to illustrate the picture over here, rendezvous means it's a two-step procedure where we assess the wire through transpapillary and we combine it with ERCP to stent it through the, the bowel duct. And then the anti-grade stent, again, we assess the bowel duct through the uh, liver aspect and we place the stent right across instead of transpapillary uh, papillary method. And the third method, hepatical gastrostomy, as, it, as the name suggests, connecting the drain between the the bowel duct as into the stomach and cholidocal duodenostomy will connect between the stand between the duodenum as well as the bowel duct. So it's pretty simple over here. So I'll illustrate one of our cases here, a 67 year old male who had distal biliary obstruction, who has failed ERCP and uh, was asked to uh, do a uh, rendezvous procedure. So this method, as you can see, um, I've injected into the intrahepatic bowel duct over here and we guide the wire down to the common bowel duct and it exit into the uh, uh, duodenum. Next, I would use the uh, ERCP scope to catch the wire and reassess back into the bowel duct and straight away we put a stand across. So this is a two-step procedure. It's more uh, conventional if we use it for benign diseases. I won't use it in malignant diseases because it is cumbersome and it's usually a two-step procedure where other methods are usually much easier. So this is another case of uh, U.S. guided anti-grade stenting, uh, which I had a uh, 73 year old with a mid cholangial CA. As you can see, the dilated intrahepatic bowel duct is visualized, and I puncture the intrahepatic bowel duct, guide the wire across anti and put a stand across over here. As you can see, as you stand across the lesion, the reason that the, the mid uh, cholangial CA is very tight over here. So that's one of the problems when you stand across the lesion, uh, sometimes uh, the lesions are too tight or when there's, rec there's recurrent obstruction, the clinical if it's success may not be successful. So like, like in this case, the patient's jaundice did not resolve despite anti-grade stamping. So, uh, so this is another of my case. So we're looking at EUS guided cholidocal duodenostomy. This is a pancreatic CA patient with distal delivery obstruction. So uh, as you can see over here, visualize a very dilated common bowel duct and I uh, puncture the common bowel duct using the FNA needle and uh, we guide the wire through up into the uh, common bowel duct as you can see over here, uh, dilating the track and then uh, place a fully covered metal stand right across from the duodenum into the bowel duct and slowly deploying the stand over here and slowly I'll release the stand outside the duodenum. As you can see, a lot of bowel flowing out, if, which indicates successful biliary drainage over here. So there's a lot of bowel coming out over here. And I usually put a double picture stand to prevent stand migration in this case. So looking at hepatical gastrostomy, as you can see the illustration here is the stand connecting between the stomach as well as the intrahepatic duct using a partially covered and a uncovered metal stand. So this is patient with a pancreatic head tumor with the previous abdominal surgery, making ERCP uh, impossible with the biliary obstruction over here, as you can see, dilated bowel ducts and intrahepatic duct. So uh, this is the gastroscopy image. So uh, again, I visualize the same principle, visualize the 
dilated intrahepatic duct, puncture the needle over here, contrast up the intrahepatic duct, guide the wire through the uh, intrahepatic duct, as you can see over here, down to the common bowel duct, and then uh, put a stand across, I'm sorry, I put a stand across over here and slowly releasing the stand. This part is at the liver and portion and this part is at the gastric portion. So when the stand is released, you can see the stand is being released right into the stomach and bowel is flowing out uh, to indicate successful biliary drainage. So as you can see, as I release the stand, there's a lot of bowel flowing out over here. All right. So you can see bowel, yellowish bowel here. And the final position of, of the stand will look something like that. Yes, uh, all right, as you can see, the stand exiting out from the stomach. And this is the final position of the stand where the por one portion is inside the stomach and the other portion is inside the uh, liver. So, uh, so this, if you, in case, this is another case, uh, I just want to illustrate to see how the stand looks like uh, on CD scan. As you can see, the stand is inside the bowel duct as well as in the stomach over here. This is a case of a hyla cholangeal CA, which I did a hepatico gastrostomy stand. So uh, evaluating the efficacy and safety of it, as you can see, a lot of studies that's been compiled, there's very high success rate of more than 90% of uh, clinical and technical success rate with very modest uh, safety profile. In the early days, the complications can be up to 20 to 30%, but this has since been better due to maturation of the technique. Uh, more importantly, over 20 years, uh, over 2016 onwards, where the, uh, study, where the complications have been lesser to about less than 15%. So it says that EUS is safe and has an acceptable safety profile. But more importantly, how do we compare with PTBD, which is supposed to be the current salvage method? So most of the studies shows comparable technical and equal successes rate. However, if you look at the adverse events, it is so much more higher in the PTBD section compared to USBD. So much so that the PTBD has up to 50% of uh, uh, adverse events. And in fact, a lot of studies, if not most of the studies quoted here, I have to have instead that PTBD has higher adverse events compared to USBD. This is personified by um, the written meta-analysis who compare uh, USBD with PTBD shows that even though there's no technical difference, uh, success difference, USBD is associated with higher clinical success rate and very much uh, lesser post-procedure adverse events and a lower rate of intervention. Therefore, we can conclude that at this point, USBD, it is more efficacious and safer than PTBD. How about patient's preference? So here we have a study looking at 320 patients to ask to choose between USBD and PTBD if ERCP fails. And visual aids are being shown to them to see which of them would they prefer. And not surprisingly, most of them, 80% of them, chooses US biliary drainage. And the main reason of them that they do not like external drainage, most of them, if not all of us, would, be, would want to prefer internal drainage if there's any case. With that in mind, uh, I propose an algorithm whereby looking at this, if most uh, malignant biliary obstruction or unresectable malignant biliary obstruction, those who have failed enough CP, we should be going towards US guided biliary drainage and not PTBD. So, uh, so as I said, USBD is the most recommended method if ERCP fails or contraindicated, and there are another growing evidence to look at USBD as a primary biliary drainage modality, but this I won't be talking about in detail, whereas PTBD is not recommended unless the patient is unfit for endoscopy, they have a short life expectancy and those who have poor functional status. So mainly because the safety profile is really much worse than USBD. So the first ever USBD was done in uh, UMMC in June 2020 last year uh, and it was very well successful and the patient did very well. And since then we continue to do nine cases to date and all of which we have eight of them successful. And that's about 90% success we have. But most important of all, we have zero complications coming up from all these patients and they are all still currently following up with me and they're still doing very well. So in summary, EUS has been and is an integral diagnostic tool in the management of pancreatic biliary malignancies. It provides clear visualization of the anatomy, able to characterize and clearly detect the lesion provide accurate local regional staging together in complement with CT and MRI, gives good histological diagnosis. 
Whereas in the therapeutic aspect, mainly the take home message in, in malignant biliary obstruction, EUSBD and ERCP should be the forefront of uh, endoscopic biliary drainage method and not PTBD. So with that, I thank you. Uh, I will take any questions if uh, there's any. Thank you, Stanley. That's a world will uh, round lecture on, on the role of endoscopic ultrasound in um, therapeutic pancreatic biliary uh, aspects. Um, so, so far in the chat box, uh, and there's no Q&A uh, questions yet. Uh, let me just ask you one question, if, if, if you don't mind, and sure. we have to move on after that. So endoscopic ultrasound uh, and its therapeutic application seems like a hybrid between radiology and endoscopy. Uh, there's a lot of ultrasound imaging that you need to uh, learn, which, as you know, most of us who train in endoscopy uh, don't have much knowledge. Um, what is your advice for someone? Should they learn some basic ultrasound before going on to endoscopic ultrasound? Yeah, I think uh, that's a very good question. So I, I speaking of personal experience, uh, I think first few uh, learning to look at a lot of ultrasound images and CT images in uh, in, uh, in comparison to say textbook anatomy structures to be able to know the knowledge of the surrounding anatomy as much as possible and to be able to correlate uh, the images uh, seen on CT as well as ultrasound. So it does help somewhat to learn some basic trans abdominal ultrasound. But for me, I begin most when I look at CT images. And of course, watching uh, more experienced uh, people doing endoscopic ultrasound to be able to familiarize the anatomy and the structure of it and how the images look on the, uh, on the, on the image screen. So it's sort of like a photographic memory. You have to really look able to recognize the picture and able to create that imagination picture inside your brain whenever you do the cases to be able to re-register, re-register the, the, how the structures look in your brain. So um, that comes with practice and of course uh, with adequate uh, guidance from experienced uh, teachers. Thank you very much, Stanley. Uh, I'm sure there'll be, there'll be uh, more questions, especially from budding uh, endoscopic ultrasonographers. Uh, but I'm afraid due to time, we have to move on to the next uh, uh, session for this morning. And I'd like to hand over to my second moderator, Dr. Suniza Jamaris from the Department of Surgery. Dr. Suniza.